I invite you to look in the uh, agenda for more information about their accomplishments. I'm just going to introduce them very briefly so that we can get right to hearing from them. So first, to your right, we have Sean Duberbach, who is Chief Economist and Senior Director of Research at the Consumer Electronics Association. Then we have Ashlyn Quirk, who is General Counsel at SSI. Next to her is Dan Wellers, who is Strategy and Research Lead for Portfolio and Strategic Marketing at SAP. Next we have Kathy James, who is Consumer Insights Manager at Keurig Green Mountain. And then finally, next to me, we have Scott Stanchak, who is Managing Director of Mobile Marketing at the New York Times. You can hear what a tremendous diversity of perspective and experience we have on the panel. So let's get to it. First of all, and let's just start with Sean. Um, why are we here today? Why are we talking about the Internet of Things today? Is there some kind of tipping point happening? And if there is, what's causing it? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely what we're seeing now is a bunch of components come together that have been in the works for decades. And we saw our first digital computer in 1943, but it wasn't until the 80s that digital computing, home computing became ubiquitous. Uh, IBM introduced the hard drive in 56, but it wasn't until the 90s when storage really became inexpensive and ubiquitous. Um, you know, kind of think about the last time you had to empty your hard drive because it was full. We just don't do that anymore. Um, and now today, one of the things that we see becoming ubiquitous is sensors. It was really 2006, 2007 when sensors became consumer facing. Nokia launched a phone in 06, iPhone launched in 07, the Nintendo Wii launched in 06. That was really consumers' first experience with, uh, with sensors, digitizing the physical space around us. So now all of those components have come together. One of the things that happens in tech when it gets cheap is we start to waste it. So we, uh, image sensors are expensive, we only put one on your phone. When they start to become inexpensive, we put multiple sensors on your phone, right? And then it changes the, the use case scenario of these devices. By putting an image sensor on the front of your phone, it becomes, you know, we introduce the world to selfies and, and other use case scenarios. We can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it changes the use case scenario. So that's where we are today, deploying sensors widely, digitizing devices, connecting them uh, to the internet. You know, as late as 2000, only about 3% of households had home broadband. The bulk of people with home internet uh, only 15 years ago were still using dial-up. Now the re reverse is true. Only about 3% of, of people who have home internet are using dial-up. The bulk are on, on broadband. So all of these pieces have come together, and we're in this kind of massive period of experimentation where we're exploring what the use case scenario looks like when we digitize something, we connect it, we sensorize it. So, uh, you know, I think what you see today with things like the watch is the, a more fundamental question of does the internet make sense on the wrist? And if it does make sense on the wrist, what's the use case scenario? Now, ultimately, that's what we're exploring. And so this period of experimentation that we're going through over the next, say, 36 months or 48 months is testing where these use case scenarios provide meaning. And wherever those use case scenarios provide meaning, data will exist. And so our, our question as researchers is, what do we do with that information? Ashton, it's you. Well, to pick up on your point, as the, as the use cases are constantly evolving, when you think about it from a consumer understanding and transparency perspective and from a regulatory review perspective, it's a very, uh, it's an emerging market, right? The FTC has just recently said they think it's too soon to legislate. They're hoping industries will self-regulate. But, you know, is it going to be readily apparent to a consumer that their vacuum can text? Uh, and that's a real life example. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just, there is so much data available. And when you think about privacy principles of minimally necessary data, what is necessary? What did the consumer understand the uses to be at the time they provided the data? These are a very emerging uh, area when it comes to the Internet of Things. And I, I think in the, using your example, 36 to 48 months from now, we're really going to see some changes in how notices are provided, how people understand what data is collected, how they may have some choice. Um, and how that is used when you think about 
uh, health and, and autos where it comes into play with things like health coverage and, and other potentially negative impact to a consumer, then the regulators may step in. So I, I think these two things are going to evolve in parallel regulation and the, uh, and the use cases. Can you hear me? Um, I want to put it more of a, I think you're <coughs> both absolutely right. I'm not sure the, the regulators are ever going to be able to keep up. And I think 36 to 48 months, I mean, we're, we ain't seeing nothing yet. Uh, the, the, yeah, one of the things about the, one of the characteristics of the technologies that you talked about, um, and as an aside, Moore's law, the, the, the power of compute, uh, compute power doubling every 18 months turns 50 this year. Um, so, so what that means is that we are right at the knee of the curve of, of an exponential explosion of the power and the connectivity of all of these sensors and all of the, um, the computing capabilities and bandwidth also. And human beings are not able to understand numbers that large or growth that fast. I mean, just uh, something I like to ask in groups is if I take 30 steps from this stage, it will take me, I don't know, I didn't count, but probably through that wall, maybe another halfway through. Those are 30 linear steps. If I take 30 exponential steps, meaning I double the distance each time, one meter, two, four, eight. At, after 30 exponential steps, I, I, I won't ask, um, but, well, maybe I will. How far do you think 30 exponential steps will take you? People I told this question to at lunch cannot, cannot answer, but um, how far? 30 exponential steps, or maybe the panel. New York, San Francisco. I'm guessing you'll be out beyond the moon somewhere. You will be around the Earth 26 times. 26 times. And most of that distance will have been covered in the last half of those steps. So we are at the knee of this curve. It is not slowing down. Um, and if you think about sensor capabilities, yes, you can measure it. You're, you're going to be able to measure temperature, speed, acceleration, pressure, geospatial locations, heat, emotions. You think about 20. Um, five trillion sensors by 2020 embedded in everything. All this data, unstructured data, um, structured data, what are we going to do with it? So that's, that's, you know, that's what's driving this tipping point or knee of the exponential curve. And we're just at the beginning. It's really exciting, but a little scary too. I've lived through this entire technical revolution and it just amazes me how quickly it's gone and how far it has come. The bandwidth build out in particular, in addition to the things that Sean talked about, we saw so much dark fiber late in the 90s that was not used right away. Then we ran into the last mile problem. Then people began to get their homes connected. DSL arrived, cable TV connecting to the internet. And now we're starting to see Wi-Fi and cellular coverage almost everywhere. That ubiquitous bandwidth, ubiquitous access is going to be the next critical piece that lets this happen now. Even today, when my husband goes grocery shopping and he wants to know, hmm, did Kathy want black olives or did she want manzanita olives? The list just said olives. I think I'll pick up my cell phone and call her. Oops, I don't have a signal in the store. I'll send her an email. Oops, I don't have Wi-Fi coverage in the store. That is the last barrier, but that one is falling now. And as we move past that, as we are truly connected everywhere all the time, this next step in the Internet of Things will happen. I'll take this one from the New York Times perspective. Um, and for the New York Times, we are a news organization that needs to be where the readers are. And especially in a day and age where news is so freely available, we have to make sure that our content can be found anywhere and everywhere. It's why we do partnerships with Facebook. And, and when Facebook has 30% of all app usage time on people's phones, we ha you have to be in living in the world and the content has to be living in the world where people are going to find you. And we as a newspaper, um, and a media organization have the opportunity to do something different. So the newspaper that you receive on your front step today is the same newspaper that your neighbor is receiving. But you can be standing next to your neighbor and your news experience on your phone should be different than what your, the news experience that your, your neighbor is reading. And it's because it's taking that personalized content and tailoring it towards what you want to read by knowing your, your usage habits. Um, 
On top of that, as I mentioned before, it's about being where the readers are. We work with Google Glass, and, and we had an offering there. Um, we were one of the first adopters from a news organization on Apple Watch. And we're very proud of the product that we put out on Apple Watch, and we've seen great reaction and, and the media coverage of our own media brand has been tremendous. But it's about taking that content, shaping it to the context that the, the user is going to be consuming it, but just being there. And that's really important. Thanks. So having heard that, us, for us as researchers, and you know, as you said, Scott, needing to be where our readers or our customers are, what do you see as the biggest opportunity to get close to our customers? Anyone? I'll jump in and I'll just say that it's, it's the data all talking to each other. We as an organization still, and I think 99% of the organizations out there um, still possibly work off legacy systems or pieces of systems that have come in in recent years that don't talk to each other. It's, a, it's one of the big reasons that no one has solved cross-device attribution, and for us that's huge. I have a mobile web marketer on my team who, who will drive, um, try to drive subscriptions through mobile web, and because we report on a campaign code perspective of last click, we're not getting the true picture of how those subscriptions are actually coming in and all those touch points. And there's people who are getting closer to being able to understand that data, like Facebook, and, and uh, you can do some through some of your, your systems, but until all the systems aggregate data into one central source for us, and I think for a lot of companies and a lot of marketers, uh, you're not gonna get this full viewpoint on who your customer is, and for us, a, a customer is a subscriber. I always worry about this kind of question because I think the biggest revolutions, the biggest opportunities are the ones that are not obvious and the people who find them and identify them will be the ones that start the next revolution. But there are some areas that are fairly obvious. I work in a business, coffee, where it's not about pushing out information, I need to ship you actual product for you to consume. So I see an opportunity where we can monitor how often the consumer is drinking, how long it takes them to consume something, and then automatically generate an order to ship more coffee to them. Maybe it's a refrigerator monitoring when they're low on food and triggering a reminder, it's time to go to the grocery store, it's time to get milk. Maybe it can automatically generate an order to Amazon to replenish the things that you find yourself low on. But there are so many possibilities, I fear that what I'm looking at is a faster horse, as someone mentioned earlier, when I've not quite been able to visualize that what I need is a delivery truck. That is a great segue. It's as if we talked about it before. So what I want to add to that, um, there are opportunities and there are threats also. When you think about everything being able to be digitized and everything being able to be tracked, things that you couldn't have even imagined before. You have new business models being created, threatening existing ones left and right. I mean, the most obvious examples, they were talked a bit about today. So Airbnb um, will, at the end of this year, be the largest hotel chain by measured by number of beds. They will have over 850,000 beds, um, and they own no hotels. Right? So do you think Hilton saw this coming? No. Um, Uber took over 50% of the taxi business in like four or five years. Um, so, so the people that get there first, that see these new, completely new opportunities, will gain outsized returns. They will gain, it will happen very quickly, and they will be very, very wealthy. Um, the opposite will happen as well. Those that don't see it coming will, will die. I mean, look at Kodak, um, you know, they uh, look at, Polaroid also, I mean, they act, Polaroid actually saw digital technology coming. What they didn't understand, what they thought was that people would always want printed pictures because that was their business model. They couldn't see beyond that. They didn't understand how consumer behavior was changing. Which different styles and methods of market research have shown them that, maybe. Um, and that wouldn't be a tactical implementation of market research. It would be a strategic one. So that's a role kind of leaning toward maybe the next question where, um, where we all might be able to play uh, going, going forward also. Um, and I think I'll just stop right there. To pick up on the, the market research point, I mean, certainly as a panel provider, SSI, 
you know, wants to figure out where our place is in con con contacting the consumer has been our forte, right? And, and working with market research agencies to make sure you have that direct relationship. If the device has that direct relationship, do you get disenfranchised from the research? And so you have to figure out what these different data elements mean in the course of the research. If the coffee machine is telling you that the user actually is not drinking the coffee, but in their IHUT responses, they're saying they are, which as a researcher are you going to rely on? And again, how do we make sense of that data? And how do we make sure that all the channels of data we have are talking to each other, I think is where our industry needs to be. I, I completely agree with you that this is coming and it's coming big to use your moon example, but how do we make sure that we're staying relevant and making sure that we're making sense of the data that we have access to? Because the data will be limitless, but how we analyze and use that data is where our, where our strength is. So you need to think about the whole decision process completely fundamentally changing, right? Today we do a pretty good job of looking backwards and making recommendations to people. Uh, and Netflix is a, is a great example where they take a lot of data and they provide recommendations. They use some basic demographics that they know about you, what you've watched, and then they look for correlations for what others like you have watched and, and what you may then like based upon things they've seen that you haven't yet seen. But when we start to connect other systems to that environment, the whole decision process completely changes. So if Netflix has access to the camera built into the bezel of my TV or the drop cam that I have in my room, then it can see how light it is, it can see how dark it is, it can see how many people are in the room, whether we're sitting up, whether we're lying down. If it has access to my nest, then it knows how warm it is, how cold it is, what the temperature is outside. If it has access to my wearable, it might see how excited I am, how depressed I am. So all of a sudden, it puts all those things together and it says, hey, we see it's dark, Sean's alone, he's lying down, it's cold, he's depressed. Like, you know, here's a Nicholas Sparks movie for you, Sean. We know that you don't normally like Nicholas Sparks movies, but so the recommendations start to deviate from historical patterns, right? It, it starts to give me recommendations that have nothing to do with who I am, what I've watched, but they're based upon the environment. And so, and the same thing could be true, you know, in a different setting. The lights are on, the microphone in the drop cam picks up that there's lots of music playing, it sees lots of people dancing or moving around quickly, um, there's sensors on the beer keg so it knows how much alcohol has been consumed, and all of a sudden the recommendations you're getting are drastically different. And they also will deviate from historical patterns, presumably, unless you're in a frat house and then they'll be very consistent, I guess. But so. The, my point is that the decisions that we're trying to measure are, are going to be dictated by, uh, by things that haven't dictated those decisions in the past. Uh, we're starting to define all of these characteristics using data, using sensors. So Twitter, for example, as, as many of you know who are in, in the marketing space, allows you to, allows advertisers to advertise to gender. So you can, you can promote tweets to males or to females. They never ask you what your gender is, though, when you sign up for Twitter. They never capture that. It's digitally defined. They define that based upon who you follow, the way you write, the type of tweets you post, what you like, and, and then within some margin of error, uh, within some distribution, they say, this is a male, this is a female. And if they can't define you digitally, then they don't let you, they don't let advertisers advertise to that person based upon gender. But, but that's how the world is changing. We don't necessarily need someone to opt in and provide us demographics because we're defining it in, within the system, within the data. And so that's how um, I, I think this world is going to change. Now we need to start to think more broadly about how decisions are made, how we define ourselves. Yes. That, sure. Yeah. Um, it made me think about a lot of interesting things. One is that um, who, and this is where market researchers, I think, can help in the future going forward. Who our competitors are is totally different in that model. I mean, and what is an industry in that model? I mean, what is Nest? Is Nest a thermostat? No. That's their entry into the gateway, their entry into the home. Um, and we, as market research, can see that. I mean, we if we we are, we know how to ask the questions. We know how to see the bigger picture. Um, the executive suite can't always see it. And those needs that Twitter is serving, in the answer and the example you gave, you would never get those by asking a person what they 
what they wanted. They wouldn't know. I mean, it's so complicated why people actually buy what they buy or like what they like. Um, but the interesting thing about it is you can be wrong. One company can be wrong a dozen times and be right the next time, and you can experiment so quickly now. That's fine. I mean, it cost $5,000 to start an internet startup today. In 2000, it cost over a million. Uh, so these threats are coming from everywhere. It's not that these people are any smarter, they're just taking more shots on goal because they can. So that's something we need to be aware of. So, so one of the problems is the things we used to measure that define decisions or define behavior, we measured them because they were easy to measure. They were easily defined. Gender, income, education, these kind of basic demographics were, were relatively easy and straightforward historically. And so we, we use those then to, uh, to help explain behavior. But now a host of other variables have become much more easily uh, acquired. And so these are the, these are the, the variables that are going to start to define that. And even we look at the way we, we do age cohorts. We talk about millennials and Gen Xers. But really what you want is he, he or she thinks like a millennial or acts like a millennial. Because that's I then I want to market to them like a millennial. And that's maybe not an age definition. So what are the variables then that explain how they think? And I, I think we're going to start to redefine the way we break up people and the way we, we break up decisions. And the things that predict what a person will do may not be the most obvious things like age, which Sean was alluding to. One of my frustrations as a market researcher is my data source. I can go to Nielsen or IRI and buy data knowing what people bought at the point of sale, but it doesn't include all channels. It doesn't include everything they might do. I can look at my own website and see what people bought and when, but that's also a very small channel. Or I can survey people and ask them, what did you buy, what did you consume, when did you consume it, but we all know that people don't always report accurately. They don't remember what they did. They may not know what someone else in their own household did. So we're trying to piece together a puzzle with a lot of gaps in the puzzle. As we get deeper into this internet of things, I expect we'll be able to see more actual behavior, better understanding of what people are actually doing when. It won't tell us why, but it will build a bigger picture of what they're doing we're going to know so much about what they're doing, we're going to have to be very careful how we handle that. So that's one risk right there, and I did want to ask about risk. So much promise you've described. What are some of the barriers are we going to get in our own way? What are some of the risks to really achieving the potential that you've talked about, Ashlyn? I'm sure you'd like to chime in on that. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everything that was just said in the last five minutes gives me cold chills of, you know, the TV looking at me while I'm having people over. Uh, and I know it's coming, and I, and I appreciate that. So I, again, I think that. It already does, though. If you have an Xbox Connect, it's watching you. Like, this is not, this is not sci fi, this is not the future, this is now. It watches you when the Xbox is on. So it's, it's there already. <laughs> Um, so I think that I think that consumer choice is going to play an interesting role here, and and what features are available to be turned on and off, and and if you turn something off, if you opt out of that data collection, do you lose a certain benefit? Is there is there a trade-off here for the consumer of I want you to recommend the Nicholas Sparks movie when I'm very depressed versus leave me alone, I'll figure out what I want Netflix. So I, I do think this is going to be a very interesting. Um, platform over the next, you know, 24 months as we see how people react to this increased value and at what point does it hit the very legal term creepy. And, and, I, and I always think there is that outside edge where, you know, no matter what you offer me, I do not want you to be able to see that I have one person over and we're lying down while I'm watching television. I mean, it just seems like it's getting very invasive. And I think that we just, as an industry, never met a data element we didn't like. And I think we sort yeah. of have to think about what is necessary to your particular project and what is necessary to get you the analysis you need. And it may not be that level of detail or granular data. I think it's, it's interesting when you start to talk to people who are very privacy focused and they are they don't want it to to create no not saying I'm, do you have do you have a facebook page uh, not in my own name no okay so 
So re regardless, you, <laughs> regardless, um, there's people who are like, oh, I don't sign up for accounts. I, I don't want them to have my contact information. And then the, the last question is, oh, do you have a Facebook account? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm on Facebook all the time. And that's my wife. And we, you know, we'll, we'll be laying in bed and she's on Facebook for an hour. And I'm like, do you know the amount of information they just collected on you? And I start to explain to her and then she's like, I really don't care, I like these pictures. And, and it's, Facebook is data. And it's the one source that people are willingly putting themselves out there saying what they like, what they don't like, what they're doing. It's, it's the reason they're a billion dollar industry in, in mobile app installs and mobile marketing. It's the reason that I as a marketer use Facebook. And if you are a marketer who are going after not just downloads or, or page views, and you're going after actions, which an action for us would be a subscription, it would be unwise to not use Facebook because of the granular data that people are self-serving to Facebook to allow them to serve you ads. And Ashlyn's point about the consumer benefit is really critical. Consumers need to see a benefit from all this. It can't just be to our benefit and they see none or they will opt out. They will see it as creepy. And for different people, there will be different levels of what is acceptable. But when we show people that they will benefit, they will get better movie suggestions. They will get their coffee arriving on time and will not run out. As long as they see the benefit, they will be willing to trade away a certain amount. The tricky thing is, because our analytical techniques are so sophisticated, we're going to know almost too much. We're going to have to be very careful about, frankly, about revealing what we know to the consumer. You may remember the case of Target a few years ago, I believe it was Target, identifying that someone's daughter was pregnant before her father knew himself based on her purchases. That's creepy, we need to make sure we don't go there. Which is gonna be really hard to do if there are 100 trillion sensors on the planet by 2030. Embedded in everything from the table in front of us to the chairs we're in. You know, what is our, what is our body temperature? You know, what, how, what is our, there are 10,000 metabolic functions which can be dashboarded at some point. How many of those will we ultimately be able to choose? Um, what's the risk with our insurance companies? I mean, it's, this, is, this problem is gonna get out of, it's gonna get beyond our ability to think about it. Um, and we're gonna go through a very turbulent time. So I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's much worse than what you said, it, much worse. It's not all about people though. I mean, we so quickly talk about all the sensors that are deployed and how they're strapped to people and, and we're invading their privacy. And it's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot that's happening on the enterprise side. So I think about um, like inventory management and real-time pricing, right? When you take all of the glass cases in a 7-Eleven and you make them transparent LCD screens, which is which are coming quickly so all of a sudden now all those glass cases are computer monitors that you can look through then you can start to put the prices there and when you start to put the prices there and you digitize the prices then you don't have to worry about menu costs you can easily update pricing so when you can easily update pricing what do you start to tie pricing to you can tie it to all different kinds of variables n none of which really in, are down to specific people so you start to do uh, you know, the, this, you price based upon the demand characteristics of that individual store. I mean, right now, if we walk out in the street and we go to, to a Dwayne Reed, chances are the price for the Dwayne Reed here and the one, you know, six blocks away are going to be the same. But they don't have to be. They don't need to be. If we knew the demand characteristics of those stores separately, then we could price accordingly. And if we could tie it into our inventory management system, we could have the last gallon of milk sell right as the delivery truck pulls up because both of those could have sensors in them, they could be tied to a dynamic pricing system. So, uh, I mean, all of that is using sensors, right? The sensors in the truck, uh, down to if it got a flat tire, then the price of the milk stops declining. And so at some point, you're, you're trying to create these equilibrium systems, right? Where you're running out of milk just as you're replenishing it and, and inventory. And so that's also the potential for the deployment of sensors. And that's not really measuring whether somebody's depressed or excited or alone. That's just looking at data that was out there uh, and that could have been recorded but was difficult to record in an analog way. 
I, I write about him in my book that you know, my dad, when he was a kid, he got paid to sit on the side of a freeway in, in the Nevada desert counting cars as they drove by, right? Because that was a hard thing to do digitally, so they did it in an analog way. I mean, we, you never see that anymore. You don't see people sitting on the side of roads counting cars as they drive by because it's easy to do digital. So anything that we do today that's, that's difficult to do digital that we do in an analog way can be likely done in a digital way with the deployment of sensors. So that's where you want to think about data showing up. And then as a result, how does the richness of the data change when you deploy the sensors? How does the precision change? How does the exactness change? There, you know, what other pieces of data do you now capture by deploying sensors into that space? You, you know, now you might be able to tell with cameras, for example, the makes of the cars, how fast they were going, um, you know, how many people were in each car. I mean, there's all different types of information, so that might be relevant if you were looking at that type of system. So I'm from SAP. I should have said all of you just what you just said. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but let me just push a little. Me. So think five, 10, 15 years from now and take all of that. Um, that, that current way we, we understand supply chains and dis distribution and pricing and think about, think about 3D printing when everything has been digitized and you can print out exactly what you want and the cost of doing that, the, the marginal cost of complexity of doing exactly what you want is zero. It costs nothing to do. So how do we then change our marketing? How do we then change our supply chains? How do we understand what customers want? Um, how do we provide materials for it, what does it do to our supply chains, our ERP systems, our intellectual property laws. The point, and I'm not getting away from marketing research, we don't, we don't understand how all of this is going to affect our businesses, and we need to think about it, because the people who get there first will win. Right, but the key to that is it changes the way we think, Correct. right? When we put computers in classrooms, it changed the way we thought about things, it changed the, pro the projects we took on, it changed the problems we tried to, tried to solve. 3D printing is doing the same thing. 100,000 classrooms in the country, 1,000 classrooms have it. It's changing the way we approach problems. It changes what we think is possible. It changes the way we think. So as a result, it changes the type of decisions that we make. And that's where it gets back to market research. We're trying to measure decisions and trying to persuade people to make decisions. We need to recognize that the availability of, of data is changing fundamentally the way we're, we're wired, the way we think. So we're going back from macro to micro, because it's the, the nature of this topic, because there's so many aspects to it and so broad. I just wanted to ask you on, on the last topic, do we, do we think we will be successful in, in doing what you described, Kathy, uh, convincing the consumers that it is a trade-off? Or do we fear a consumer backlash? Do we fear some kind of really tough legislation that's really going to make a lot of these great things grind to a halt? What do we think? The legislation will be driven by what consumers do and don't accept. If consumers find value in it, I'm not worried about legislation coming in. I think that the really dramatic things that we can do will be a little bit farther off, not because the technology will take longer to arrive, but because it will take time for people to adjust. For that very reason, I think that in away from home channels like hotels, you will see some of these technologies kick in before people are willing to pull them into their homes. It's not going to be as threatening if we discover, just to make something up, that people who tend to stay on higher floors in a hotel drink more coffee or drink a different kind of coffee because that's not tied to an individual person. It happens at the level of the hotel. It makes the hotel happy. They can better meet the needs of their consumers. It will take a little bit longer, in my personal opinion, before consumers are ready to be so monitored at the level of what happens in my home, what can be tied to what I, Kathy James, personally want to do. But it will come. Millennials are already more accepting of giving up some privacy than Gen X and so on. I think that trend will continue. And I think that one potential risk to the industry, though, is, as everyone's been saying, there's going to be new players, given this new technology, given new opportunities. And new players don't always understand some of the legal framework. So when you're thinking about a self-regulatory uh, organization, you, an industry, you don't want to be pulled to the bottom. You want everyone to come to the top so that you don't get scrutiny. So as I think about your Airbnb and Uber examples, both of whom violate the laws globally, 
yeah, they're big. I don't know if that's sustainable. I'm not their lawyer, but I, I do think there's going to be this constant struggle as new people come in. We need to be careful that, that we are getting that transparency and understanding at the consumer level, and even more importantly, that they understand the security. Because if you had a big data breach, it doesn't matter what happened, you're going to lose all consumer confidence. So you want to make sure that the, the people coming in also understand what they need to do on the back end with their products to make sure they're doing security audits and to make sure whatever data they are collecting is, is adequately protected. Because I think that's a big risk as well when you're talking about these huge data sets. Our time just flew by, but I do want to ask you all one, one final question. What is it that really excites you? What do you see in, in your role that, that is a really exciting uh, development in this area that, um, that you're thinking about right now, Scott? Let me start with you. Yeah, I think it's, it's um, the new avenues. And again, for, for the, from the New York Times perspective, it's new ways that people consume news. It doesn't need to be a... 1,000 word article that someone's reading. It could be a one sentence story on the watch. It could be the headlines that show up uh, if there's a breaking news on your dashboard in your car. And people are gonna freely um, choose which news provider that, that they wanna go after. Um, but as a company, and I think as, as we've seen in other organizations like BuzzFeed and, and um, Circa was doing it, um, depending on how long they're doing it for um, moving forward, but um, trying to make the consumer experience better based on the data that they're collecting. And from the New York Times perspective, we, we always used to be the, the news organization where people came to the Times because we told you what's important. And people would rely on that information, and they still do to this day, but now it's not 100% what the Times tells you it's important. It's, it's a percentage of what the Times tells you that that is important, and then a percentage of what you really want to read. And I think that's important. So I'm, I'm just excited in general about um, the consumption habits and how we can tailor our news experience um, and how we can reach new audiences based on these. <clears throat> I'm excited about the speed with which we will be able to answer questions. The speed of my business is already that I need an answer yesterday, not tomorrow. We don't have the time to do custom research, but if we have a very rich data set with a lot of consumer sample in it, if we have a lot of data collected, we can run an analysis on that very quickly and get the answer that we need. My business partners are going to absolutely love that. It cannot come soon enough that we can go forward quickly. It's really hard to pick one. I mean, I didn't even talk about like Bitcoin or self-driving cars or are all these things which are gonna completely change both society and business, but I, I'll, I'll summarize it all by something Ray Kurzweil, the futurist Ray Kurzweil said probably a dozen, a dozen years ago, and it was about the effect of this exponential function, and what he said was that progress, and I'll kind of paraphrase it as change, because it's not always progress, change in this century will be equal to the amount of change over the past 200 centuries. So we can't predict but it's gonna be, we're in for a big ride. I guess I'm excited that privacy lawyers are highly employable in this particular era. Uh, the, the road to evolution, uh, revolution will be paved with a lot of missteps from a regulatory standpoint, and I do think that just because regulators don't understand it, to your point earlier, they're not gonna catch up, does not mean they won't throw their hats in the ring. And so sometimes that's an even bigger challenge, is educating the, the legislators of what is relevant and what is important and what are the keys. So I, I think that we're gonna continue to see um, a, lot of, a lot of activity. So I think the fundamental basis of all of this is that when we digitize an environment, when we sensorize it, when we connect it, it fundamentally changes that environment. I already gave the example of the selfie. Driverless car is another great example. Look, when you, digitize, sensorize, and connect the, the vehicle. And that's essentially what the, the original Google driverless car is, right? It's a Prius with, with a bunch of sensors strapped to it. It's connected, it's digitized. When you start to digitize the physical space around that vehicle, then it changes the experience fundamentally. It changes what you can do inside the car. And ultimately, you can customize it. So you don't need to sit forward anymore. You don't need to have a steering wheel between your legs anymore. You don't have to have seats anymore. I mean, you could essentially, and if it really fulfills the promise, you don't need seat belts, right? Because there aren't accidents. 
There aren't desks. I mean, you, you could start to put infinity pools in there. You could put a hot tub in there. You could put a desk in there. You could put a bed in there. You get to customize it completely, change it fundamentally from what we've known. So that's the great promise. As we start to digitize, sensorize, connect these environments, they fundamentally change from, from what we've known. So you look at Uber as a digital platform or you look at Airbnb as a digital platform and the thing they share in common is that they're essentially allowing us to take capital that was being underutilized and utilize it more efficiently, utilize it better. I mean, to me, I think the valuations we see on Uber is because that looks a lot like a driverless car system, right? You don't need to own a vehicle when you have a driverless car system, if you're just retrieving a car to take you from one place to the next. So there, there, everything that we, we kind of think and know can and, and will change when we start to digitize it, sensorize it, connect it. I've seen, um, I'll give just one example. Uh, I saw a baby monitoring system, right, that came with two, so essentially you had um, a baby monitor, and the traditional historical baby monitor is a sim a simply a microphone and a, and a receiver, right, a, a speaker. So you're in a different room, you hear the baby cry. Well, this digitized the crying, and it sent it to two bracelets. One's pink, one's blue. The father wears one, the mother wears one. And you pre-establish an on-call time system. So if the baby cries at 11, it only vibrates the bracelet for whoever's on call during that time. Now you still have to negotiate who's going to be on call when, and that, that will be a dance that everyone will have to go through. But uh, you know, when we start to digitize that environment, then it changes who's waking up for, with the baby and at what time. So there, I mean, everything, everything is on the table when we start to digitize it, sensorize it, connect it. I'm inspired by a, a lot of what you've said, maybe not the Nicholas Sparks movie, but a lot of what the other hmm. information you've given us here. And I'm also really pleased as a researcher to hear you say that all this data won't necessarily tell us the why. So that's a good thing to, to leave us with. I'm really sorry we didn't have time for questions, but perhaps you might be able to catch some of our panelists afterwards. In the meantime, please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.